Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the launching of Lancet paper, Universal Health Coverage in Indonesia, Concept, Progress, and Challenges. Now we will have a panel discussion with the topic of defining high priority and high impact research and publications to advance universal health coverage. We are honored to have our panelists, Dr. Suwarta Kosen, Doctor of Public Health, Dr. Dr. Agus Rizal Hamid, and Dr. William Summerskill today. Materi diskusi akan disampaikan dengan bahasa Inggris, namun demikian pertanyaan dapat diajukan dengan bahasa Indonesia untuk selanjutnya diterjemahkan oleh ahli bahasa dari panitia. To lead this session, I would like to invite Dr. Anra Shankar DSC as the moderator of this panel discussion. So I will introduce uh, the, your, your bio, sure, just a short. So Anra Shankar DSC completed with his doctoral degree in immunology at Harvard University and began a career and began a career aimed at integrating basic science, public health, and human development in the context of nutrition. He has conducted large-scale nutrition intervention trials and field research, and designed health programs in multiple countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. His research aims to better understand complex relationships and design interventions with rapid impact. His work is highly interdisciplinary, spanning from cell biology to health systems and cognition to artificial intelligence, and he has extensive experience with government, non-governmental organization, and academia, and has authored over 100 scientific articles. Moreover, Dr. Shankar is a very strong advocate for development in, of high-impact research and institutions in low- and middle-income countries to create local and global impact. So, Dr. Shankar, the floor is yours. This is this mic's working. Okay, great. Yeah. So I just um, yeah. So I think our goal this afternoon we wanted to go over some issues about how to conduct uh, high impact research, and the goal the goal of doing the high impact research is to do research that has a benefit to the community, and uh, the secondary goal of that would be to be able uh, once you had valid research to be able to publish that in a journal. And of course, you would like to be able to publish that in a high-impact journal. But <clears throat> it's not a good starting point to think about uh, how you're going to uh, write a paper for a high-impact journal. Your starting point should be, what is something that is important, unsolved problem <laughs> that I would like to solve? <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about like, how to identify those sorts of issues and what's necessary to do that. And then we'll have some, I think, very good uh, discussion about that. So next slide, please. So <clears throat> just to reframe uh, what is research, we often ask this question. And uh, of course, uh, research is really about this. It's right, it's creative work. That's the first thing to understand. It's about creating something new. And actually, I want to emphasize that even if you replicate someone else's work correctly, um, that is actually creating something new because you're affirming what someone else had done. That's why it's not just doing search, it's research, right? So replication is very important. And uh, creative work undertaken, it's un done in a systematic way, that's very important, and to increase the amount of knowledge and particularly the use of that knowledge, right? So knowledge is about, um, it's useful when it's translated into action. So that's extremely important. So um, that's really, I think, one of the themes of the paper that uh, the UHC paper, uh, all the recommendations with respect to action are extremely important. Uh, next slide. And then innovation. This is always something you want to be thinking about. And these are some key bullet points about what innovation actually is. And uh, I think I want to really focus on uh, this idea of the assimilation of uh, new things, novelty in science or economics or any field, right? So innovation is not just about what we traditionally think of as science, but innovation is, uh, can apply to any field, whether it's implementation, whether it's action, whether you're, you're evaluating someone giving you a talk. Uh, all of these things are, uh, can be evaluated and whatever you find out from that can be translated into action. So always be thinking on everything that you're doing, what kind of innovation there actually is there. So next slide. So, <clears throat> so how do you choose a topic, a research topic that might be really interesting, might be high impact? So you can often start with this sort of thing, identifying hot issues. So issues that have not been really solved before or that people are talking about a lot because they're very important in some way. So right now, 
uh, on the global stage, there's several important issues. Amongst them is uh, universal health coverage. Another one is uh, what? Who can name another hot topic in global health? Stunting. Someone said stunting. Yes, exactly. Stunting is another one. Okay, one more. Obesity. Yes, obesity. Yes, very, very good. Just, I see in the, fr the, the front row is experts here. Uh, so, exactly. So this is something you can think of. What are these problems that have not been solved? And is there some idea you have, some innovative idea you can have, some research to really uh, address those? So, next slide. So. When you're choosing a topic, these are some of the considerations you have to, you have to decide for yourself. So I would say this bullet point number two is always select really the most relevant, exciting topic. Don't select topics that are very simple or uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uninteresting. And the reason for that is that <clears throat> if you choose a research topic that doesn't have a lot of importance, even if you execute that successfully, it's still not that important, right? So especially when you're a young person, an aspiring researcher, most of you here I see are pretty young, including Puck Suarta and Ivo <laughs> Admirita, I would say. But um, because when you choose such a topic uh, that's more challenging, you're going to learn a lot more out of it. And it's likely also that the findings from that are going to be more useful, right? It's, it's an unsolved problem because it's a difficult problem. And you probably heard about it because it's important also. Uh, so next slide. So I always try to phrase this, go for uh, a wow project. And wow with respect to solving something that wasn't solved and something that can lead to some sort of significant action. So what are some of the characteristics of a wow project? So next slide. Uh, so it should have national and global impl implications. Again, you're solving something very important in the country, and it's something that's valuable to all countries, to all persons. So sometimes I read papers from Indonesia or a manuscript submitted for publication from Indonesia, and it says, uh, this is the first time this is being done in Indonesia, or this finding applies to Indonesia. So that's, that is of interest, of course, it's important for Indonesia, but you also want to think how that finding might be important for other persons in the world, right? And today with the uh, huge globalization, that we're all interested in how to help each other, right? So you want to interpret your finding, you do your research and interpret your finding in the context of what's happening in the world, not only Indonesia, and it's likely to be of value to others. So next, <laughs> so try to think of uh, what's that big question that you have, and what is the best way to answer that? Whether it's a randomized controlled trial, uh, uh, pooled analysis, data, whatever it is, first think, what's the best way to do this? What's the way that is really gonna answer this question? Later you can think about, can I get the money for that, or I don't have the skills. First think, what is the way to really do it? What's the ideal way to address this particular issue? Next slide, and uh, next. Go ahead and list there's some wow characteristics. Okay, go on. So these are different sort of wow, wow. I think there's one, one more, yeah. So these are these sort of wow characteristics. You don't have to fulfill all of these, but I'm just mentioning these. One is it's large scale. And large scale, it's not just for the fun of doing something large scale. The large scale becomes interesting because at larger scale, you can actually start looking at the heterogeneity of effects of some intervention on a population, and particularly if you're trying to look at uh, impact from a public health perspective, in today's world there's a lot of interest in scaling. How can you actually achieve impact at scale, right? So that's where when you do something on a larger, larger scale as a research project, the lessons you're learning from that are more likely to be directly relevant to public health, okay? So it's, so it's not just for the fun of doing a really big project for millions of dollars, but there's actually a very practical aspect of that. Uh, then you want to use innovative, innovative approaches, some new way, perhaps you have uh, diagnostics. Right now a hot, a hot topic or hot thing is everyone has a mobile phone. What kind of diagnosis can you do using a mobile phone? Image analysis or you know, other information processing, machine learning, AI. So that might be you know, uh, something, sort of, something innovative. So you might say, hey, how can I apply a AI uh, an image analysis for diagnosis 
of uh, some NCDs, maybe hypertension, for example. So that would be potentially really interesting. And then the third one, it creates a new kind of paradigm, a new idea of some sort, right? So uh, like for example, um, let's say uh, active screening and detection of tuberculosis is something that uh, has been done, but it's not really, it's not really cost effective because it's so expensive to go out and do this active screening, get the sputum smear, get that red and so forth. But let's say uh, you thought of some way that you were thinking, well, a big change in the paradigm shift on active screening and detection would be if the cost goes below a certain amount, right? So you might say if it goes below uh, like a dollar per person for the screening, that suddenly becomes uh, something that can be done at scale. So then you start looking around for how you could do that for less than a dollar. And if you succeed in that, then that creates a paradigm shift. It's something now is possible that was never possible before. So you think about you know, those sorts of things. This, and this uh, fourth one, it, it, if you, the characteristics of a WOW project is that you're answering some question in a careful way. So whether your hypothesis shows that yes, that intervention works, or whether it shows it doesn't work, in both cases, it's still important to know, okay? So like something uh, with respect to uh, universal health coverage, uh, for example, some intervention for active enrollment of persons that are not, in, not enrolled, trying different aspects of that end up being very useful. As long as you do it carefully, if you know, well, doing promotion uh, house to house, house to house promotion of enrolling people in the JKN system, let's say you attempt that. So let's say it works. Great. It works. Very interesting. Let's say it doesn't work. Actually, that's still very useful, right? Because you've tried something that really should work in principle, but it isn't. So that means the thing is, the issue is much more complex. Uh, and then, of course, could lead to a new big idea or solution. Uh, next slide. So these are just some general questions uh, from the paper and from the discussion today in the morning and from the press conference, I think, that uh, could be proposed as uh, um, a WOW project. Um, for instance, um, what mix of interventions will create 100% enrollment? So that's important not just for Indonesia, but for other countries, right? Because UHC is being rolled out in many, many countries now. So this issue is not solved, right? A lot of different ideas that we heard. Should you make it a legal requirement? Should you try to prosecute people who don't enroll? Should you have incentives? Different approaches for different groups, socioeconomic groups. So this is something, if you did some research to solve this, be, be very interesting. Uh, how to reduce the big burden of tobacco by UHC incentives. Is there such a framework for that? So in Indonesia, 70% of the men are smoking. Uh, this is one of the absolute worst health crises in the world. Uh, is there some way to actually address that? Can you think of some way, right? This is a, a big win, actually. Almost any th research that you do in this area is like a wow project because it's such a serious, devastating issue in the country. And just, yeah, I won't, I won't say any more about that, okay? <laughs> Uh, what about this? This is a really, really big one. What is the yield, in fact, from preventive, the URC universal risk coverage and promotive care universal cause coverage? So this was a formalized new paradigm. People have talked about this, but in this paper, this was a formalized new paradigm that was being proposed. So it sounds like a good idea, and there's some evidence to suggest this would be a very important and useful thing, but is this really true, right? So can you somehow do some analysis of the cost for uh, intervention using uh, various preventive or promotive activities, and how much can you spend on that so it actually reduces claims, makes it cost effective? And what are those in interventions? Because not just Indonesia needs that, but most countries in the world are so scared of universal health coverage because of the money for non-communicable diseases, right? So if you can solve that, and show that this early investment really is important and there's a quick return on investment, that's a, a big deal. So if you can think of different sort of interventions that would do that, that would be very important. So for instance, 
stunting reduction, rapid and low cost uh, diagnostics for screening, early childhood development, maybe you're gonna get some of these maybe longer term, some might be more short term returns on uh, investment. And what about the use of frontline information systems? So this is one of the recommendations. So is having information you know, come in on a regular basis, this is like implementation research, that information coming on a regular basis, using it for proper decision making to inform uh, how to track a client, how to provide the services that are necessary, uh, how much does that actually lead to more customization and more effective impact of the universal health coverage? So that's an unanswered question, not only here, but in the world in general. Uh, uh, interactions between infectious diseases and NCDs, this is very important. Both of those exist here in Indonesia and are increasingly are gonna exist together in the world because most countries, low and middle income countries, are transitioning, right, from infectious diseases, uh, uh, transitioning is not the right word because it, it sounds like a good thing, but uh, they're, they're getting an increase in NCDs. So they have coexistence, right, of these two, these two things. Um, and then uh, I just put this other one. So these are all examples, right? And you can debate which one's uh, sort of more of a wow and less, is, less of a wow project, but it's good to sort of you know, think of what would be interesting uh, in this context. And there are a lot more things that actually could be proposed that are worth uh, discussion. Uh, next slide. So then I wanted to just highlight this, this issue of uh, integrated information. So part of what makes something very interesting is that you're taking different types of information and presenting them in a new type of interpretation or in a way that gives greater insight or easier to understand that insight. So this is from the paper, and uh, you can see on the left is age distribution of enrollment. That's interesting, but the really interesting one is on the right-hand side. So this was done, actually, this is showing the uh, equity, right, the wealth quintile, proportion of enrollment for each uh, age group per wealth, wealth quintile. And so just from looking at that, you can look at that picture, at that graph, for probably half an hour and find lots of very important bits of information. In fact, I would say probably about at least a third to half of the total important information in the paper is encapsulated in that graph. <laughs> okay, so you can see very clearly the kids uh, zero to four, really low enrollment, except for the rich ones, right? And even that's low. So even in rich families, uh, kids are not getting onto health insurance. And in the poor families, it's absolutely terrible. Then if you get up to slightly older ones, you can see that what's fascinating is there's this, um, uh, the Q1, right? The Q1, you start seeing going up and sort of approaching the wealthiest ones, right? So Q5 and Q1, uh, as you go up there, they start to track closer to each other. So this is because what's happening is, as mentioned, people who are sick, people who are sick are getting on to uh, the universal health care and if you're poor, you tend to be more sick. So more of the most poor people who are older getting sick are enrolled in the universal health care, right? So, and so you should be thinking about as you're doing your, your research, what are the different types of information that are helpful to integrate to give more, more insight into something? Now, next slide. Um, this is a, another paper of I see Pak Suarta is here. He's a co-author on this paper. This was published recently, again, looking at the decline in, um, or change, I said, uh, in uh, uh, communicable maternal uh, neonatal nutritional disease versus non-communicable disease and injuries. But it's plotted three separate ways. One is the total number of uh, disability-adjusted life years. The next one is disability-adjusted life years per population. And the last one is age-adjusted and give slightly different information. But by interpreting this, you can see that a lot of the issue is that the rate of NCDs has stayed more or less constant, but you're getting a lot more older people. So it's the aging population that's creating uh, more of a burden in this context. And of course, the maternal and child health, you're seeing substantial uh, improvement there. 
And then, of course, for the accidental injuries, there's a big peak there around 2004. Uh, what is that? Tsunami. Tsunami, right. The experts in the front row here continue to be experts. So that's, that's exactly right. So that's the uh, tsunami. So next, next slide. So again, this is sort of a unique presentation of that inf information that's giving you, uh, you can look at those graphs and interpret that and understand what's some key information there. Okay, now, what about for your interdisciplinary group? Again, part of doing this sort of uh, WOW project is bringing different bits of, different types of experts together, uh, much like the UHC uh, paper. So for UHC research, if we want to do more of that, you need this really mixed group of people. And the earlier you get this group together, if you want to do this kind of research, the earlier you bring them together, the better, because it's going to take at least six months for them to all learn each other's professional language, right? And they have to learn to respect each other. That's probably the bigger one, right? Because sometimes scientists who are doing basic science, sometimes they're thinking that a person who's a health systems person, like, uh, that's not, high, that's not as, as high science. And the person who's doing health system stuff, they, they think, well, their work is very important for human health, and the basic scientist is just doing stuff in the laboratory, right? So the way that success happens is when they start to learn each other's language and start to realize that each of them is actually trying to do something good, so the more you exchange information, then you get something really interesting happening, and you can create some new discovery, right? Something new can be done that couldn't be done before. But so this interdisciplinary aspect is a very important part of creating high-impact research in today's world, okay? So next slide and you know try to again and get the international uh, perspective uh, I won't spend much time on this next slide uh, so this is just to highlight the collaborations that Indonesia has in the world you can go to the website there it's very interesting this is just tracking you see Indonesia there and there's a line uh, indicating sort of where the most collaborations are so Indonesia has a lot of collaborations with the European countries with the US Japan Australia and China Canada, starting some collaborations with uh, some countries in Africa, not that many really, but that might be a very interesting opportunity because a lot of the countries in Africa are pushing toward thinking how they want to get on to universal health coverage. So there might be some very useful lessons there from Indonesia. Uh, next slide. So these are just the benefits of uh, different collaborations. I think they're fairly, uh, fairly obvious. Uh, I think you cannot underestimate this idea of exchanging new ideas and procedures. That's a, that is, ends up being extremely helpful. Uh, next. And these are common problems once you get to the publication, which is that whatever topic you chose turns out not really to be globally relevant, which means it's not really addressing some important issue. So that's why at the very beginning you need to be thinking about that. Your conclusions maybe are not interesting, Usually it means it's because the study wasn't done in a way that was um, allowed you to make a definitive conclusion. Uh, rec recommendations are not generalizable. Again, same kind of issue. And the fourth point is actually one of the most important that I find most common is that there's a big underestimation really about how much effort that uh, it, it takes to do the research and prepare and submit the manuscript itself. Many people are surprised, like on this UHC draft paper, how many drafts we, we did? It's like 40 or 50. It was like at least 50 drafts, at least, right? And, and so, I mean, that's a normal thing, right? Uh, so you go, 50 drafts, how many words was it, Bill? It's like 5,000, I can't recall exactly. 30,000, right, sorry, 30,000 words, yeah. So, yeah, so you can imagine, so it, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of effort. Right? And even up to the last minute, we were making various you know, changes to it. So you, it, it, it's a lot of work, so don't underestimate that. You're not going to write one or two drafts and, hey, it's ready. Right? And then when you submit it to a journal, it's going to be rejected. So, so don't forget, though, that being rejected is a good thing, because right? that's part of the process on, get, on getting it published. Right? So, so always think when you send it to a... Uh, send a, a paper to a journal and it gets rejected and you see that uh, email to you, you should feel happy, actually, right? <laughs> so, 
Okay, next. I think, and these are just some other things that are important. So you have to kind of plan to keep doing the research and the writing of the paper on your schedule. It won't happen by itself. You have to actually make time for that. And this last bullet point for any of the university academicians, or any of the university academicians or uh, deans, any of the deans here, or any, the only way a faculty member or researcher can succeed in doing research is if they have time to actually do that, right? So I think Indonesia, I know there was a lot of discussion about wanting to increase the yield of the publications. Uh, I would say the important thing is to increase the type of good quality research that's being done, do that first. And the only way to do that is to uh, enable uh, your uh, scientists to have time to do that. You can't expect they're going to be doing clinical work and doing teaching, and then somehow they're going to produce great research. That's just not a possible thing. Okay, next. Uh, so be committed. We already talked about this. Next slide. I think this is, I think that's about it. One more maybe. Is that it? I think that's it. Okay. So uh, that's all. That's to kind of get us kicked off on this discussion. Um, I would like to invite up here uh, Dr. Suwarta Kosin. Uh, Park Suwarta is a, um, I've known him for a long time. He completed his doctoral degree in international health at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's a member of the Indonesian Technical Advisory Group on uh, Immunization. Uh, he's done a lot of expert analysis on economics. Um, he's written many research papers. Uh, he's a, a big asset to Indonesia, he's done a lot of interesting work. Uh, I'd also like to invite Dr. Agus Rizal Hamid, yeah? And um, Dr. Agus, he graduated from the Faculty of uh, medicine at the University of Indonesia, 2001. He's a specialist in urology. He completed his doctoral degree at Radboud University in uh, Nijmegen, if I pronounced that right, 2000, Nijmegen in 2016. He's currently, and we'd love to hear his perspective, the uh, chief editor of the Medical Journal of Indonesia, and uh, also on the medical staff of the Department of uh, Urology at the University of Indonesia. And then I'd like to invite uh, Dr. William Summerskill, who we know as Bill. <laughs> and Bill is the uh, former senior fellow at the University of Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Uh, he's currently a senior uh, editor at The Lancet. He's worked with various groups, uh, the consort groups, uh, the, the Cochrane Collaboration, many of you have heard of these, uh, US Food and Drug Administration, World Health Organization, He's really active in all aspects of the Lancet Journal, from the peer review process to writing editorials, strong advocate for clinical research in Asia. And I think Bill's played a very big role in establishing the presence of uh, the Lancet in the uh, Asia Pacific region. And he mentioned how many more papers about Indonesia have appeared in the Lancet even uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, I want to welcome our esteemed group a panelist here, and uh, let me just um, uh, kick this off uh, with uh, Dr. Suwarta Kozin, just to share any reflections that you have about uh, high impact research here in Indonesia, and I, I know you had done some very nice work, you published this paper recently in The Lancet also, so it'd be great to hear your thoughts. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. So I will present short presentation about global burden of disease and the road to universal coverage in Indonesia. Next. So basically, we use definition of the SDG 3.8 that includes financial risk protection and access to quality essential health care services access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicine, and vaccine for all. The Global Battle of Disease Study basically try to identify gaps and challenges and develop the national level responses to improve the availability, accessibility, 
appropriateness, quality and equity of healthcare. Next. This is the paper that published in Lancet 2018 before in the online also. On the road to universal care in Indonesia, 1990-2016, a systematic analysis for the global burden of disease study. Next. So basically, uh, this is only the review. Basically, we divide diseases into three groups. First one, existing communicable disease, maternal, and the second one about non-communicable disease, the third one about injuries. The first one actually include also nutrition and maternal. Next. This is the one that explained by Dr. Sankar before. So basically, uh, we are interested what happened uh, since 1990 to 2016. And the non-communicable diseases basically uh, decrease significantly. Uh, the, sorry, the communicable diseases decrease significantly and the non-communicable disease increase. But the injury basically keep the same. Next. This is the detailed diseases. If we can see the leading causes of DALIS in 2016, this is 90. This is 2006, this is 2016. Almost all, majority are non-communicable disease. So we know that 65% of our burden of disease consists of non-communicable disease. With the leading one is ischemic heart disease, stroke, stroke vascular, and then diabetes. And, but we still have the communicable, like tuberculosis, diarrhea. Road injuries also become a problem. Next. This is the risk factor because we are talking about uh, non-communicable disease. So we are interested what are the risk factors. Number one actually hypertension, high systolic blood pressure. Number two about dietary risk. Number three mentioned by Dr. Sankar before, tobacco consumption. And then high fasting plasma glucose because our diabetes now probably around 15 million in Indonesia. And the other one about malnutrition, air pollution, this is the high body mass index, obesity, or overweight, and cholesterol, and the other thing. Next. So basically, uh, we know this like dietary risk related to cardiovascular disease, high systolic blood pressure related to cardiovascular disease, and also stroke, those things. So basically, leading the DALIS level risk factors related to the diseases. Next. So basically, uh, Right now, we are completing the global burden of disease estimate. This is the national estimate. But now we have 34 estimates, 34 provinces estimates, basically. Because we know our country is too big and the uniformity is not right, actually. So uh, we have some diversity in the geographical, demographic, cultural, and also in the health system development. So like the East Indonesia is less developed than West Indonesia. And we need also later on to understand more about disparities, like related to uh, urban rural stratification, isolated population, in small islands, border or isolated area, to be able to direct appropriate health policy and program. Next. So basically, why we have so many variety in our country because of this, this transition. So basically, the, the, we have demographic transition, urbanization, industrialization, those things, and decline of infectious disease, fertility decline. So we have epidemic transition due to demographic transition, but there are protracted polarized epidemic transition. So there are some area that develop differently. So less developed than some, like Jawa, Sumatra, Bali, basically very good. But if we talk about Papua, Maluku, less developed. Next. So this is the, the other exercise that we do for uh, celebration Almata, 40 years Almata in Astana. So we found out uh, using GPS, actually. So we found out that actually Yogyakarta is very good. Everything is within one hour of travel time, 
but if we go to the island, Bangka Belitung actually uh, not too bad. That's about the medium one. You cannot you cannot reach the like the uh, health facilities within one hour in the island, Bangka and Belitung. Of course, there are so many other area worse than that, like Timor, Papua, and the other. Next. So basically, we can conclude we have life expectancy increase 2016, increase actually by eight years. This is quite a lot. But we still have problem in non-communicable disease, but we observe some decrease in the communicable maternal and neonatal and nutrition. So basically, we can proclaim that we experience double burden of disease with domination by LCD. And this changing pat this pattern will increase our healthcare costs sharply and also challenge our universal coverage achievement later on. Thank you. No, we. Yeah, yeah. No, we should know about the condition, condition of our access to healthcare facilities. We actually collected the GPS, but we can read only two provinces. The other 32, we collected garbage GPS. So we have to repeat. Okay, so I'd like to pose, uh, um, did, did you have something to present? Okay, so I'd like to pose a question. You're welcome to go to uh, the podium, but, uh, or you can stay there either, either way, whatever you, you prefer. Um, the, um, so as a, as a journal editor, so for sure you see many different uh, articles submitted. Um, could you comment a little bit on what you see are the main issues needing to improve the quality of research that's being done and the relevance of that research and uh, perhaps then comment on what you feel would be some high priorities for uh, universal health coverage. But uh, the first two would be especially interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anuraj. Uh, also, thank you for the committee that from, medic, uh, from our journal can uh, have a discussion here. Let me tell you that uh, in Indonesia, actually there are, as you know, there are at least 30 medical journal in Indonesia. But apparently, that who get internationally indexed until now, I think it's only three. So that's the real condition, I mean, down to the earth for what's, what's happened in our country. So like already Dr. Anurad said that the problem uh, the article who submitted to our uh, journal is I didn't say about the the quality of the topics but the most problem is the quality how they're writing so I think there is also need the improvement how to make a writing yes that's I don't know maybe who write very good already submit to Lancet or more high impact but in but but I believe a um, lot of article that can be submitted in our Indonesian journal. As actually, since I uh, become an editor in chief, I, my first writing is also uh, cited uh, from the Lancet editor that our country actually it's more, much more oral culture than writing culture. So more gossip. If I, if I must say, if, I, if it is the right word. So it's more oral culture. So uh, that's why after we got indexed by Scopus, a lot of article already submit. But apparently, 
I didn't I didn't see any article it's writing about universal health coverage. I, if I'm not mistaken, only one or two. So actually, that become our priority. That's if from the audience already started to make a study about the uh, about the Indonesian condition about the health system. We will going to be a, a priority. And as I remember in my first volume that we already invite. Uh, Ministry of Health to write about the uh, germas, I mean about the health policy in Indonesia. So I think this it's showing that actually our journal also priorities or uh, make emphasize for the any publication about the health system in in our country. Yeah, so those that's uh, very interesting reflections on that. And um, how do you feel the um, so you, you have uh, experience, you're the, uh, do you exchange uh, information with some of the other journals also, just in, in terms of how, um, is there a process you have to actively improve the writing or the quality of the writing based on your sort of shared experience with the other, other journals? What, what's your suggestion about that? Uh, yes. Uh Actually, maybe in our country there is a lack of uh, workshop or I don't know. The main problem is, as I can see, it's in educational program. Because in 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 undergraduate or in the postgraduate, they are not really how to say it, uh, get the more uh, experience or uh, courses about how to write. For me, I, maybe I got lucky that I got a lot of uh, experience doing writing when I, I take my PhD. That's the difference. But m more of scientists who stay in Indonesia need more that kind of, uh, kind of courses. Because I, we already got invited by some other journal to get uh, give uh, courses or same idea. Maybe in next year we, are from, we will co collaborate with the other journal. Actually, we have the the commission uh, or the collaborators Indonesian Medical Journal Association, but still, you know, yeah, depends. Everybody is busy in Indonesia. Outside the outside the institution, I mean, the busy is outside the Indonesia. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, very helpful. Uh, we're going to come back to you, I think. Um, Bill, I'm going to uh, go to you on this issue of defining high priority and high impact research to advance universal health coverage. I'm sure you have some thoughts on that and would like to hear that. And in addition to that, could you comment on this idea about um, this, this, this pursuit of high impact research versus publishing in high impact journals and how they're the same and maybe different. So I'm going to give you that challenge. <laughs> right, thank you, Anu. Well, I was struck listening to the presentation that you gave and the fact that it's essential to publication is not the writing, it's the research question. It's defining that right question, like the lovely picture you put up of people holding umbrellas and then the one person using it as a boat. And it's the greatest stumbling block is failing to find a question that is meaningful so that the answer is actually going to be important. That it's specific enough so that within the resources available, you can answer it, uh, it's formulated in a way that can be answered, and then it's novel to be of interest for publication. So it's time spent finding that right question, which is more important for the fate of a research article than all the polishing and writing that you try to do around it afterwards. Not everyone is going to be able to choose a high impact question. 
but I like the way a high impact question was defined, that it's a question of such importance that whether the finding shows one answer or another, or in crude terms, whether it's positive or negative, it can still inform practice. And we used that philosophy at the Lancet about 20 years ago when we introduced something called protocol review. This was long before protocols had been published, long before trial registration. We got very frustrated by seeing research that had flawed methods. And because of those flaws, really wasn't interpretable or publishable. So we invited people to send us their protocols, essentially send us your research idea and how you plan to answer it. And if we thought that the question would be of interest to our readers, that is, if we thought it was a high impact question, we would then arrange peer review of the protocol, we'd feedback recommendations to the authors, ask them to revise the protocol, and then make a commitment to publication in principle before they'd even started the research. So that if it's an important question answered properly, it ought to be publishable. Um, so that's a high impact question. It, but a high impact question needs high value methods to take it through. And the great thing about a high impact question is it's focused around a population. Think if you will of the evidence-based medicine format of PICO. That is putting your clinical question in the format of what was the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. A simple four column question. And by doing that, you can actually phrase it so it can be answered. So if you have a high value question, and you can answer it, then that's going to give you information to guide that population. And for the Lancet, our population is people. It's the clinical care of individuals and populations. Now that's quite different from designing a question around the role of being published. If you want to publish a paper, then it's a matter of finding where the hot topics are uh, where the funding is and joining the crowds that go that way. But I hope one thing that will come out of today's analysis looking at universal health coverage in Indonesia is the questions are really important ones. They're questions about how to control tuberculosis, what to do about maternal and neonatal mortality, how to stem the tide of non-communicable diseases. So those aren't simple routes to publication, but those are routes to improving care and clinical outcomes. And if it's answered well, because those are questions of universal significance, applying to countries around the world, then it becomes possible to publish it. So I would say reframing the goal to the important clinical question and then the publication will follow rather than aiming for the publication which might be a trivial clinical question. Thank you, Bill. That was a really, uh, really uh, useful, useful feedback. Um, I'm going to ask you and then Dr. August, um, what would you say after being here today and thinking a lot about universal health coverage is um, uh, maybe one key research question that you see, not necessarily your, your A number one top one, but whatever comes to mind you think might be interesting. And then uh, Dr. August, I'm going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> I've only been here a little over 12 hours, so I'm, I'm trying to think. I have to say, I was so struck today by, I think, the friendliest reception 
I've had in a hotel in as long as I can remember. And not a fancy hotel, but it was smiling. And normally when you go into breakfast and hand in your piece of paper, you grunt because it's early and they grunt and tick your name off a list. But I have to give it a plug. This is the double tree, handing in a room number and someone looked at the list and said good morning by name. And it was followed by every member of staff that I saw was cheerful and enthusiastic. And I thought, if you take that social capital, that enthusiasm, that willingness, that cheerfulness, and multiply it even by half of the 260 million people in Indonesia, you have a phenomenal resource. And universal health coverage, we've got slightly wrong because we look to governments to provide it. And we look to health systems to implement it. And then we realize governments haven't got money, health systems don't have the resources for health. We need to be looking at people. Self-management will be the only way in which good quality of life and good outcomes will come from large burdens of non-communicable diseases. And that snapshot experience this morning of cheerfulness, enthusiasm, positivity, and concern for others, even strangers, actually opens up incredible opportunities for self-management, and self-management that can also include helping out your neighbors. And I would love to see community-based research, and I, I have a hunch Indonesia might be just the right country for that, that shows actually how people, uh, ordinary citizens, can be the real answer for uh, universal health coverage of non-communicable diseases, rather than all the fancy people with stethoscopes. Just one topic. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, what interesting me actually is uh, because we are number four. I just realized that we are number four biodiversity in our uh, in in the world. So I think. That's also become nice idea because uh, to to break down all the the database that we have here to become more specifically in different area because that will make uh, our policy or our strategy of, of course including the how to attract the uh, how to uh, uh, focus on the people but how to manage because I think in Java it's totally different because if you see in the map. It's very crowded, but uh, the, it's, it's not the best, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's not the best health system in Indonesia. So we should explore that in its province. So that will make a lot of, and then we try to compare uh, on and suggest, give a suggestion to the government or to uh, medical uh, faculty in that area how to change their education how to change the for the pro promotion prevention things and uh, it's more uh, how to say personalized uh, strategy in each uh, province that's, that's what i thought okay so yeah i think we had a very uh, sort of quick overview of uh, some of these ideas of defining high priority high impact research to advance universal health coverage. You heard three sort of, I think, very different and innovative ideas around uh, universal health coverage research going forward. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, what are your questions and, uh, and comments about this? And um, I think we have uh, a translator, expert translator here. So uh, any questions in Bahasa Indonesia or English uh, are perfectly Okay, so we are ready. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Terima kasih. 
Saya Dr. Bahar, mewakili Ikatan Dokter Indonesia. E, dari pagi sampai sekarang, saya berterima kasih bahwa kita bisa melihat adanya kerja-kerja keras untuk bisa mencoba menyelesaikan masalah universal health coverage. Tapi faktanya yang dialami dalam sehari-hari, pertama adalah konsep. Apakah telah sama konsep kita? Misalnya contohnya, ID beranggapan konsep daripada universal health coverage bukanlah volume, tapi adalah value. Dan value itu ada tiga komponen value. Dia lebih efisien, lebih ramah, dan lebih kemudian menjadikan pasien sebagai subjek. Kalau itu konsep yang kita sepakati, maka dalam penelitiannya progresnya juga, juga dilihat di situ. Yang kedua adalah tentang quality. Pertanyaannya, apakah setelah sepakat kita tentang quality? Kalau quality kemudian memakai pendekatan lima dimensi WHO, maka nanti progres dan kemudian challengingnya juga kita akan lihat ke sana. Yang ketiga, fakta yang kita punyai, adanya kelembagaan di dalam penyelesaian pelaksanaan universal health coverage yang belum adanya clarity, belum adanya koordinasi, belum adanya kohesi. Dan ini menyebabkan data berbeda-beda sehingga provider maupun pelaksana itu akan mendapatkan dan mendap meminta data yang berbeda-beda. Oleh karena itu, kalau ditanya kepada ID apa yang kita harus lakukan untuk melakukan penelitian ke depan, Pertama, samakan dulu konsepnya dan setelah konsep itu disamakan, kemudian baru kita teliti dan kita punya basic data. Oleh karena itu, contoh sederhana, kematian ibu itu tahap survival, tahap thrive, atau tahap transform. Kita nggak pernah melakukan declare tentang itu. Tapi kalau kami dari ID, kami mengatakan itu adalah tahap survival. Kalau tahap survival kita cari sebabnya, root cause analisisnya, dan kemudian kita lakukan intervensi, dan kemudian itu melibatkan semua pihak. Jadi sekali lagi, kalau dari ID, poinnya adalah ini suatu pekerjaan bagus, tapi embrace, seperti teman saya katakan tadi, embrace the solution, jangan jalan sendiri-sendiri. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, a lot of questions, so <laughs> I'll try to uh, translate it. Check. So the first one, the concept. Thank you. The first one is uh, the concept of uh, universal healthcare. It's not volume, but value. Is it correct? Uh, it's to be more efficient and use patient as a subject. Uh, so sub uh, and number two is the quality related to five dimension from WHO, and the third one is the organizations provide uh, different provider provide uh, different data, so this will impact the uh, how government uh, relate with this uh, data and how to, uh, the concept itself is very diverse and how to have the same concept on this thing. Okay. So basically, we should stick to the current global definition about universal coverage. You are right, not only about volume, but quality is important. So fully access, but no quality, useless. That's why in the second slide, I show that basically in the SDG 3.8, they mention about two conditions. One is about quality essential healthcare services. The second one about financial risk protection. So the quality, but should be affordable, not making Catastrophic to the patient. Yeah, 
uh, you were also raising this issue about um, what is really uh, the common purpose? Like, do we have the same idea? Uh, you gave this example of the uh, antenatal care or care in, care in pregnancy, that are you actually trying to just provide the basic services or something else as part of the preventive or the promotive care? That is, is there common thinking on that? Is that right? Did I understand that? Right? Is, is that right? Did I understand that right? So this, this idea of, you know, what, what it actually do we have a common thinking ab about that? Yeah. I, I think what uh, Dr. Bahar already mentioned that actually that's our real condition. I mean, everybody, every institution have their own institution or d definition. And I think we, now we start to, to do the collaboration. I mean, this article is it's good. Uh, example for uh, how to say it? Uh, for uh, for defining the difference definition like already Dr. Bahar said about the uh, ED have their own uh, definition about is it the concept about the volume or the the sorry volume or value of course it need to be this more intense discussion between uh, institution and then that will make our uh, universal health coverage become better. Everybody, I mean, I know we are, we, we realize that every, uh, every institution, I, uh, I know because I'm also a clinician, I also have a meeting in, in Ministry of Health, so I know how they doing by themselves, but apparently it's now it's getting more collaborative. And with this data, we know that Dr. Rina may be only for small group, but it can be very good example that we have to do the collaboration between the ED or uh, medical our medical association, Ministry of Health. We already have Dr. Suara in our institution, or also for the NHIS in Indonesia. And then, like Dr. Anuraj already mentioned, we have to define the common goals or uh, what is what what we want to do we want to improve it or else like that thank you very much for the opportunity my name pancho kaslam um i'm working uh, for the maternal and neonatal program um this is a a good um paper uh, especially actually i attended this um, discussion because i already following lancet for uh, such a long time even in the twitter also and then even uh, when we started with the program of uh, maternal neonatal survival we uh, quoted the lancet finding in the year 2011 that the reduction of the neonatal death is only happened when the health system in place rather than maternal child health program and that uh, also happened uh, here that the concept progress and challenge is very good uh, even though we haven't read because it's just started launch this morning what we are worried is that in the universal health coverage we're talking about that uh, most of the attention dragged into the financial points but we've forgotten that the other important factor is the human resources and when this human resources is the one who make it this financial is uh, available and this uh, coverage is really accessed by everybody and this human uh, resources also uh, may uh, cause a, what we call it a challenging to disseminate so, so my uh, suggestion actually I didn't put up this morning but I put up that these findings is already with the putting so much effort for two years should be available for everybody in Indonesia. So one of the challenges here in Indonesia that most of the health providers, they are not aware of the updated standard and updated information. And I recently also read in the British Medical Journal stated that most of the uh, public, they got information is not from the health providers. They're coming into from the other resources. So in this case, when we are talking about uh, universal health coverage, the public should be aware also, so when we can, we can also um, make them educated and 
what they are expected to do. So they can do some prevention and some uh, effort to uh, keep themselves healthy rather than with the present situation when they think I already enroll, I already put up my money into the coverage so I can do anything, even I can go into the bungee jumping because I got the coverage for this. And this is uh, the perception is not only happening for the public but also the health providers. You know, before the universal health coverage or BPJS happened in Indonesia, many of my colleague business people, which is not a medical doctor or not in the health, they think that this is a new business, so they develop new hospital, new facility, with the purpose that this gonna going to be income for them. So this actually causes a really a uh, problem. I agree with Prof. Uh, Will uh, Dr. Williams since morning. He talking about investment. Do we think that this one is infestation, investment for us? Because most of the people think this is a spending. So we have to invest in the health, uh, universal health coverage, not to use it, but to make sure that we are still healthy. I don't want to spend for my money to pay for the, uh, the insurance to prepare that I, or I put that money to get my health back. So this, this thing, I think uh, I following your discussion and the study, in Indonesia, when we recently did the evidence summit, about 3,826 general research I saw uh, for newborn, only 10 from Indonesia. But when I went into the Indonesian uh, library, University of Indonesia and Yogyakarta, I found a lot, it's more than 10,000 done by the local but not published. So this is the challenge. So I, I'm not saying that I want to argue with this morning saying that Indonesia is lacking of the publication in the world, but we are lacking of marketing. We are lacking of informing the global, the international of what's happening. So maybe one of the things, maybe uh, the, what we call it is after they graduate the PhD, the doctorate, the paper just throw away or just put under the drawer. It should be made known for everybody. So this is, I think, the message I can and do it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very uh, interesting comment. So one of the issues there was really uh, the, human, the human resources for health, uh, how that might be a gap, although that's uh, lacking. It's, it's a huge part of universal health coverage success or not. And then I think the other issue you raised was um, the, um, uh, the type of research there's a lot actually being done but it's not uh, it's not getting disseminated um, so uh, I think there was something else in there as well but um, any comments from Agus or Bill or Swarta no, I think the comment is very right it happened also in our institute research institute we have now I think six or seven journal but the impact factor is very not as we hope. So basically, uh, as you said, in Indonesia, still very, very few uh, papers go to the high impact journals. So I think this one, the good suggestion, uh, Sankar, if we can make something to improve this. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a good point that we don't have to look at only the financial works. I mean, because actually a lot of topics that we can uh, discuss or, or analyze uh, for the universal health coverage. And it's also actually surprised me about the how not that much any article that come up in, uh, in abroad or internationally, maybe because a lot of study put only on the drawer after they finish because like already Dr. Bill said that sometimes they only make that article only to finish their for the for the graduation and the supervisors not try to supervise them and try to really to make what is the benefit for the for the people and then if they think like that of course they want to publish it and then it can make a reference from for the other people or another researchers to 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 yeah 
to look at uh, that data. Actually, that's what of our struggling in 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 our journal. Uh, we wants to have that a lot of our more article that showing our uniqueness in in Indonesia. That's what one uh, uh, one of our mission in our journal. That's it. Well, I agree with all the points you were making, and you made one point about dissemination, that uh, people all over need to know about this. And I'm looking at Dr. Rina, and I'm very, I'm hesitant to suggest this, but if it was felt to be of benefit, and the authors wanted to, uh, we would be delighted to post a translation in, in a local language so that it could be more accessible. But that's, a, that's a, a big ask. It's a lot of work to do that. Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. <laughs> um, and uh, this issue you raised about uh, the human resources uh, issue, I think that's extremely Im important. Uh, you're right, a lot is uh, talked about the UHC from a financial standpoint the deficit from a financial standpoint, but the deficit from the human resource, resource standpoint is uh, probably more serious, right? So um, I always say uh, it's people who help other people. Everything else is just a tool. And um, so I think maintaining that uh, frontline workforce, uh, the capability of those persons, supporting them, they should be well-trained, well-supported, uh, that's something that uh, I, I think Indonesia and many other countries, there's really not enough um, attention on that. And it may be that uh, this universal health, uh, uh, health coverage initiative actually may be uh, a gateway to uh, focus more on some of those issues also. You know, the what's necessary for the standards, because you talked a lot about that, right? The standards at the clinical level and also their standards in practice. Uh, so those things, I think, um, this may be a good time to uh, be able to, to refocus on those issues, because uh, that gap is a very large one. And we see in many countries, there's uh, indicators, for example, a very good coverage of antenatal care or skilled birth attendance, but you still see uh, mortality rates for the mothers and the kids is high. So it means that the coverage itself was not enough, right? There's uh, some kind of a quality or execution gap there that still needs to be uh, addressed. Very good point. So th yeah, I would say that as a topic of research would be very useful also, that would be useful for, in useful for Indonesia and other countries. Good, other comments, yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nama saya Tari, saya dari FKUGM Saya ingin bertanya Jadi uh, kami sedang melakukan penelitian JKN uh, Ada pembahasan juga tentang UHC Pendekatan yang kami gunakan adalah uh, metode realis evaluation Jadi uh, penelitian ini dilakukan di 10 provinsi Tetapi masih berjalan 7 provinsi Uh, yang ingin saya tanyakan, kami masih me, apa, masih belum percaya diri untuk menuliskan hasil penelitian menggunakan metode realis evaluation karena uh, metode ini sampai saat ini masih berkembang juga uh, metode realis evaluation itu uh, menurut literatur uh, metode itu cukup kompleks Uh, bagaimana tips dan po, uh, yang yang harus kita framing dalam menuliskan hasil penelitiannya? Terima kasih. Yes. Okay, I'll try to translate it. Uh, so you're using uh, you are doing uh, JKN research uh, on US UHC, right? Okay, and doing with a risk evaluation method uh, for 10 provinces ongoing seven at the moment 
but uh, not confident enough with the method because it's complex and what's your tips for doing this method and for this topic? Is that all? Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, so that was, that, that was so uh, my understanding was uh, you were doing research in, uh, intended for 10 provinces, currently in seven provinces, and your goal is to assess uh, the risk evaluation of some sort, right, for access to universal health coverage. I didn't quite catch what the risk part was. What's the risk that she's evaluating? There is a, yeah, yeah. There so is basically a she, she's doing a realist evaluation method, to, yeah. What's it called? A realist evaluation. evaluation method, and she's not confident to write a, a, an, an article on using this method. Realist evaluation okay. method, yeah, for the study, right? Well, do, can you describe just a bit about the method, I guess? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oke, okay, uh, jadi metode realis evaluation itu uh, dia metode yang mengcapture jadi program kebijakan itu bekerja atas konteks apa, mekanisme apa dan outcome apa. Jadi untuk JKN salah satunya adalah transparansi data. Jadi pada pada konteks daerah maju maupun daerah tidak maju, ternyata keterbukaan data dari BPJS itu sama. Kemudian untuk uh, hmm. pemerataan itu pada daerah maju seperti Yogyakarta, Jawa Timur, Jawa Tengah itu uh, pemerataan pelayanan kesehatannya bagus malah surplus. Tetapi pada kota seperti NTT dan uh, wil NTT Sumatera Utara dan Bengkulu itu tidak demikian. Uh, konteks sama mekanismenya dan uh, konteks itu kita menggalinya dari latar belakang program atau kebijakan mekanisme itu kita dari uh, kognitif atau afektif dari si konteks itu okay. ya yeah, I think it's it's a it's an interesting study but um, yeah it's a, so she try to capture the the program based on the context and the mechanism like it, it is more like a qualitative study, qualitative study, right? Or so you review the, the program, like you uh, highlight the transparency of the data, and she also try to um, uh, find the the, dis, uh, the distribution of the of the health um, health services. Uh -huh. So it is more like you. She, she she describe a, she make a review of the uh, program based on the context and the mechanism. So it's more like a, a review, a, a review, just like a Dr. Rina did, right? Doctor, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. But she's doing an original research. Maybe Dr. Rina could add some information. <laughs> or you can even you you can comment and then and then answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think what um, what she would like to uh, ask the panel yeah. that how can she be confident to publish her data where she has ten different provinces data on the uh, using the realistic uh, qualitative studies so it's actually a kind of original research where they really go to ten different provinces and then looking at the how the transparencies how the program is being done and how actually the J JKN or Universal Health Coverage or BPJS operating. I think that's okay. actually uh, what you're actually your concern, right? Yeah. Whether this kind of study can be published in high impact factor. I think that's the comment that you would like to ask, right? Yeah, tapi dengan nice. metodologi realist evaluation. Yeah, yeah. So, but the method is not quantitative method. It is a qualitative method which might be um, having a, a kind of a constraint on the methodology point of view. Yeah. Okay, I think that's what okay. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll take a, I'll make a few comments on that because I've done a lot of um, work on qualitative data also. And uh, I think the most important thing is that <clears throat> uh, is the data that you've collected, is it collected in a way and a sufficient quantity to represent um, the idea or to evaluate or assess the idea that you're interested in. So I think that's so whether it's qualitative or quantitative, really those are the important things. So for instance, many people do um, for qualitative data, if they're interested in assessing uh, community perceptions, they'll do uh, a focus group. So doing a focus group, there's a certain way to do that qualitatively. But most focus groups are actually not conducted in a correct way and they're just discussions. So that's not a focus group. So the, when you look at the data from that, you can see that um, it, uh, it do, it's unlikely to represent the opinions of the persons in the focus group. So it would be, it would be interested, it would be useful to look specifically at what kind of data you you have and how that was collected. But I would, uh, I would say that if it's collected in, uh, if it's qualitative data collected in a rigorous way, that it's likely to be useful, can be, can be published. It's a, uh, yeah, and depending on what the topic is and what level of interest is, it might even be uh, of interest to a high impact journal. But the, the real question is that whether or not the data collection procedure uh, is sufficient to address the basic question that you had uh, in the beginning. So I, it'd be great to hear from others. That's a great question. I'm sorry it took us so long with the ventilation system to hear exactly what you meant. Are you okay with me answering in English or would you like me to go through a translator? Okay, so f first of all, to put people's minds at rest, qualitative research uh, can be of interest to high impact journals as well. It all comes down to the question and how well it's answered. At The Lancet, we published a beautiful piece of qualitative research from Bangladesh that explored why there was such a low immunization rate in young children. It actually worked backwards from the quantitative data that found a high death rate from preventable diseases and then showed a low vaccine uptake but only with the qualitative work were local customs regarding when mothers could leave the house to take the child for vaccination revealed. And that resulted in a change of practice with vaccinators going into the houses. So the next question that you asked was about heterogeneity. And that's a really important one, and this can have an enormous influence on the ability to publish research. So in a quantitative study, one would expect to have a very explicit sampling method to try to guard against too much heterogeneity so that you have data that are going to be comparable between the different groups. With qualitative research, qualitative research needs to be just as rigorous as quantitative research and to follow its chosen paradigm. 
so that if you were using, for instance, a grounded theory approach, then you would be going, you would be continuing the iterative process until you had addressed the heterogeneity and you had saturation of your data. So if you're doing a grounded theory approach and you're still seeing heterogeneity, then there are questions that may need to be asked about uh, how, how the, the process is being undertaken. Uh, I think it's just similar. Is in Indonesia, it's, it's okay? Okay, ya. Yeah. Mungkin bahasa Indonesia ya. Kalau uh, sebenarnya standar jurnal itu sama. Jadi maksudnya gini, uh, tadi sudah dijelaskan bahwa tidak penelitian kualitatif pun tidak apa-apa. Dan itu tadi sudah dikasih kasih contoh bahwa itu nah, bisa terpublikasi. Tapi yang paling penting adalah itu tadi. Kalau kita menambahkan apa edit value-nya atau uh, uh, apa yang bisa diungkapkan dari data tersebut. I think the most important is what is the edit value from that data. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter quantitative or qualitatively, uh, but uh, the originality, edit value, and then of course what is can be the impact for the uh, health policy or changing the system like uh, already give the expert from uh, Dr. Bill. Jadi mau 10, mau 7, tadi saya juga kurang mengerti tentang ten, apa itu teman-teman statistik yang lebih mengerti, tapi uh, apa dari data itu yang bisa diceritakan, apa dari data itu yang bisa disampaikan kepada pembaca, kalau kita dari segi sisi jurnal, yang bisa dipakai untuk perbaikan. Bisa ke, kalau tujuh provinsi sudah cukup banyak sebenarnya dibandingkan kan dan mungkin kita bisa merefer itu sebagai jur, apa namanya uh, beberapa provinsi seperti itu jadi itu sangat kalau bisa menceritakannya atau bisa menunjukkan hasilnya itu dengan baik itu akan menambah nilai dan bisa juga dipublikasi gitu. Yeah, um, she further asked um, so the burden the burden is that uh, the lack of ability to write in English scientifically for the young researcher. So, um, is the quality of writings itself taken into consideration for the selection process in publication? Then, do you have any suggest suggestions to improve this, um, to tackle this burden for the young researcher in Indonesia? Masalah apa bahasa Inggris ya? Yeah, uh, uh, menulis dalam bahasa Inggris okay. tapi scientific. I think it's not only for the young investigator. I think all investigator from Indonesia had the problem with that, because we must realize that we English is not our second language. Our second language is Padang, Madura, Jawa, whatever, and a lot of a uh, lot of uh, language. So I think that's the main problem. I mean, uh, of course there is. Yeah, uh, what I think, yeah, the, the pro what we should do is we just start to write it and try to collaborate with the other institution or English institution to look at is it the, the, the data. I mean, any institution have uh, their writing centers. I don't know in UGM, but UE, we have uh, our writing center. Uh, I think yeah. there's some yeah. also university, even in, in if, uh, if I'm not wrong, in the United States, they have a writing center. I mean, they, their, their daily language is already English, but they have writing center to, 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 to make the uh, article in English. So I don't worry, that's everybody's problem. I think in here in Indonesia, uh, any other? I always feel very uncomfortable when people who've done research in their own language, in their own country, are then submitting it to a journal in, in another language. I, I can't imagine how difficult that must be. Now, contrary to your experience, I have never received a manuscript that I can't read enough to understand what was done. At The Lancet, we're not interested in the quality of your in English. 
We're interested in the quality of your ideas and your science. English can be corrected. When you read a journal, the style and the flow of the language was not the way that manuscript was written. Everything is edited. At The Lancet, we have more copy editors than we do uh, editors who process man who uh, are doing peer review because each accepted article is totally rewritten from the beginning to put it into a style that's more easily understood. So as long as we can understand what was done, uh, we can work with you on the English. So I wouldn't want anyone to feel reluctant to submit to an English language journal because they were embarrassed by their English. And if you get a uh, response back from a reviewer that criticizes your English, please ignore it. Because as editors, I ignore it. I think what a stupid response. I didn't write to this person to ask them about the grammar. I write to them to ask them about the science. Uh, so please don't be put off. And please don't spend lots of money to go to one of these writing uh, companies to rewrite your article. Because uh, I've had people complain to me when an article has been rejected, and they will send me the receipt and say, why was it rejected? I spent $2,000 having the English polished. Uh, and that's, that's just tragic. I think it's already covered by <laughs> Bill and um, Dr. Agus, but I, I think um, it is a challenge for Indonesian scientists to think of a global impact of a paper. Maybe that's something that we do not really teach our students much about it. So we are always thinking about Indonesian context. Maybe that's my experience with my student. But uh, the second, I think, ideally, we should have a um, wow project or groundbreaking project, groundbreaking research that will actually end up with a very good uh, paper. This is something which is actually, I would like to honestly mention, I've been struggling as a scientist. Yeah, maybe if I continue to talk, I can, try, I can cry. <laughs> um, there are not so much uh, support for us on this particular area. Uh, in terms of protective time, in terms of money, and in terms of the support system. So this is what I would like to actually ask all the audience here to, um, to really try to write any uh, WOW project to many different um, societies to get funded. Then we can have a very good groundbreaking research. This is something which actually really a problem in our uh, uh, society. And the third one, uh, I think, about commitment. So what we experience in this Lancet paper, we actually uh, coming from uh, many different peoples in, in many different meetings, but then um, we find out that actually the one who actually uh, really uh, come into this particular uh, writing is those who are actually putting their time and commitment and patient and, and then actually really wants to do mm -hmm. something different. So I, I, I don't know, maybe this is something they would like to share about. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rina. That's a very uh, Can good, I have a good comment. Another? Oh, yes. Yeah. We'll have you, you and then we'll have a, a couple others here. So you have to let's, let's, let's get your comment uh, pretty yeah, yeah. quick because we only have five quick. minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Saya tidak khawatir tentang bahasa Inggris atau bahasa Indonesia. Karena ilmiah itu akan ada jawaban yang ilmiah. Dan kita diberi kesempatan untuk bertanya kepada majalah apa yang ingin kita tanyakan. Dan itu terbuka kemungkinan. Justru yang saya khawatirkan dalam era post-truth ini adalah hasil dari penelitian ilmiah dibelokkan kepada kepentingan-kepentingan yang sebetulnya tidak ada di situ. Contoh, ada satu laporan yang saya kira kita tahu, Crossing Global Quality Chasm. Itu jelas suatu laporan yang dibuat di Washington tentang bagaimana Universal Health Coverage ini 
kalau dihubungkan dengan quality dikatakan large and empty vessel. Ini sesuatu yang kemudian bertentangan dengan hak asasi manusia. Jadi saya nggak khawatir sebetulnya, karena kita paham cuman bagaimana kita tadi seperti Dr. Dina mengatakan memanfaatkan kemampuan kita untuk bertanya dan berkomen dengan cara yang baik dan benar. Terima kasih. Oke. Okay. give us a... I think he just replied, but uh, actually he's not worried about the language or about technical, but I think the, he just worried about if they use the data for the something else. I don't know, about politics maybe? That's what he's afraid of. That's, that's the, 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 the feedback from him. I, uh, I, th I think we are the same. Of course, we are, we are uh, scientists, we are in the, uh, of course, with scientific uh, climate that we only think about, I mean, it's already mentioned Dr. Bill in the beginning, that we, if we want to make a research, we have to make a good research question and then try to answer the, the problem is already in, in, the, in the people. That's it. Uh, and Rani, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, and Rani. Hi, hello. My name is Inraini. So I'm from uh, Summit Institute of Development. So I think uh, the key summary of uh, today very interesting seminar is about the most important thing right now in Indonesia is about uh, health promotion and prevention. So we don't want this, uh, for example, based on the this presentation, it states that under four years old, uh, it's very low coverage. So today, Prof. Akmo already mentioned about how important the competency of uh, doctor and nurse, but I think no one uh, mentioned about how important the midwife, right? Because if we talk about pregnancy and uh, children in Indonesia, especially is uh, the first person who will meet with this pregnancy woman is midwife. So I think if we talk about wow uh, topic, maybe we need to explore more about uh, the role of midwife and if we know that there is funding from BPJS for promotion and prevention, but there is no evaluation, there is no research that um, talking a lot about this topic. So I think it could be interesting for all of us and also as the baseline of the policy in Indonesia. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are you a midwife? Okay, great. Okay, that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, please. Yeah, and I would uh, agree with you as well. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Terima kasih. Uh, mungkin saya dalam bahasa Indonesia saja, nanti mohon diterjemahkan. Uh, nama saya Nur Zaini, saya dari BKKPN. Uh, Saya tertarik untuk membahas tentang uh, high impact research and publication. Uh, sebagaimana kita ikuti dari pagi bahwa di Indonesia baru ada 79 artikel di Lancet tentang Indonesia. Dan ini uh, sangat sedikit bila dibandingkan dengan negara-negara lain. Nah ini saya uh, tertarik jika uh, kita membandingkan dengan negara-negara tetangga tidak perlu jauh-jauh seperti Thailand, Malaysia, Singapura itu untuk menjadi lulusan uh, master atau untuk doktoral itu harus terbit menerbit uh, harus uh, terbit dalam uh, jurnal internasional itu pertama. Jadi saya kurang tahu apakah di Indonesia itu sudah diterapkan untuk uh, dapat menjadi seorang master atau seorang doktor itu harus punya artikel yang terbit di jurnal internasional itu yang pertama. Yang kedua mengenai uh, untuk kita sama-sama tahu bahwa salah satu kendala untuk menjadi uh, peneliti uh, apalagi high impact riset dan publikasi ini adalah biasanya adalah salah satunya adalah ketersediaan data apalagi tadi uh, Prof Anuraj uh, sempat mention about uh, large scale uh, data jadi uh, kita sudah punya IPAM IPAM itu bisa diakses oleh seluruh uh, pengguna seluruh uh, peneliti Tapi apakah data uh, 
uh, tentang Indonesia ini sudah bisa diakses di IPAM. Setahu saya ketika saya mencoba mengakses data seperti uh, de, apa namanya uh, JKN itu masih belum tersedia di IPAM. Uh, ini khususnya tentang uh, Indonesia. Nah, pertanyaan saya apakah ke depannya data-data uh, tentang JKN ini bisa uh, tersedia secara uh, online dan bisa diakses oleh siapa saja. Sehingga ini harapannya akan meningkatkan jumlah publikasi internasional di jurnal internasional yang terindeks Scopus. Demikian. Terima kasih. So basically, yeah. He said that around 79 article only on the Lancet. And compare with our neighboring countries, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, we are left behind in the international journal. And he said about the availability and uh, of Indonesian data. Because in his experience, they are so difficult to find or to get to obtain some Indonesian data. So uh, he's talking about the JKN data, about the insurance, insurance data. Let's keep keep by the institution, not publish. Uh, let me try to reply. Jadi sebetulnya Pak, yang pemerintah sekarang sebetulnya sudah berusaha untuk keterbukaan data. Ini datang dari orang nomor satu, dari RI sebetulnya. Jadi mungkin nggak lama lagi akan terbuka semua Pak. Memang betul bahwa JKN itu dia umpetin semua datanya. Termasuk kami yang di Badan Litbang ini nggak bisa akses. Ya kan? Kalau mau akses dia yang dia yang analisis, dia kasih hasil ke kita gitu loh. Itu kan nggak nggak standar. Jadi ini akan berubah pak dalam waktu dekat. Karena semua diminta baik BPS, baik Badan Litbang atau kesehatan datanya harus uh, public domain karena uang negara, uang publik. Jadi ini kita tungguin aja tinggal ininya. Karena sekarang ini memang ada kesulitan. Saya juga kami mengalami juga pak. Misalnya data dari survei-survei uh, BPS, kalau dibandingin data dengan makro internasional demografi dan survei, dia langsung ada di website. IFLS misalnya, Indonesia Family Life Survey langsung ada di website, udah clean, ya kan? Tapi Reskesdas misalnya tidak ada di website. Kita harus uh, apply dengan misalnya rencana baru nanti diberi tapi nggak boleh the whole data. Kalau di SS kan the whole data. Mungkin Atmarita tahu paling banyak sudah itu. Enggak maksud saya ini akan berubah Pak dalam waktu dekat karena sudah ada komitmen dari atas. So, uh, I think um, we're going to need uh, to bring this session to a close. And if any of you have additional questions, we'll be here for a bit. We're happy to interact with you. Please come down to the front and we'll, we can have some additional discussion. But this has been a very uh, productive session. I would like to thank the panelists, uh, Dr. Suarta, Dr. Agus, and uh, Mr. Bill, I will say, <laughs> Dr. Bill. And um, especially I would like to thank uh, the audience and all your very uh, nice questions and thoughts uh, and and contribution. So with that, uh, we'll bring this to a close and uh, enjoy the rest of, of your day. And uh, keep thinking about really interesting topics and doing very good quality research. And uh, do that well, and um, you'll be successful in getting your work uh, published in a, a good journal. So thanks so much, everyone. Best okay, of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shankar and all the panelists. And we will have a photo session together. So we invite all the participants to come up to the stage. Oh, the photo will be taken from the stage. So the participant yeah, should gather around the, uh, the, the sofa. Tahan. Tahan, yeah. Gak bebas mah kayaknya ya Eh gak bebas Ya itu kan ketiga Cips. Siap ya Satu, dua, tiga Tahan Tahan ya Gak bebas mah kayaknya ya Eh gak bebas Ya itu kan ketiga Siap ya Satu, dua, tiga Terlalu bebas <laughs>
dua, tiga. Oke, okay. okay, satu, ya. dua, tiga.